Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Conscious Vibe Podcast, where we elevate intellect through conscious dialogue while exploring race, politics, business, and culture. I'm Dr. Daryl L. Jones, and I'm Charles D. Mitchell. Chris Monroe. Yes, sir. How are you? I am blessed. How are you doing? Absolutely the same. That's a good way to be. And I got to pull back. I didn't even say hello to my, my buddy over here. We're talking. How you it's doing, all, man? It's okay. It's all good. Man, I'm just a you know, <laughs> third million <laughs> day. <laughs> I have never not said hello to my man over here. Man, you good uh, for real? I'm great. Good, man. Yeah. Good to see you. Happy I to sent you guys I sent you guys some rain. Did uh, you get it? We, each other, but we haven't seen yeah. each other in this venue. You did send us some rain. Yeah. And actually, we needed it. So we're not complaining, Chris. You can have it. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, Chris Monroe. Um, and where do I start? I think it was what, 1997 when we crossed paths. Yeah, right. You were in a meeting. You were actually giving a presentation at Nike. I'd been on less than a year. And I said, OK, so there is another brother. <laughs> I think you were hiding in golf, right? At the time. Yeah, I was the only uh, one of you in that group, I believe. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, hey, man, look, I could um, I could go on and on. I will give some highlights and then I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about um, your childhood, where okay. you grew up and sort of quickly what brought you to Nike. But again, man, my experience with you, Chris, you were one of the first um, other brothers who I met at Nike because I was in the golf division and, you know, I hadn't really had much engagement with other folks outside of golf, period. And I recall you giving a, a very uh, impressive presentation, and then you and I started talking, and from then on, man, whenever I was in Portland, yeah. trying to connect, et cetera. But not just that, man. For me, it's the values that you always represent, and I tell you that all the time. Um, I've trusted you with many things, and, um, You've always delivered, you know, vice versa. That's the relationship we've had. We don't go a long time without talking, but if we do, you know, someone will reach out and just to yeah. check. You. Yeah. Uh, but again, man, your background is be well beyond Nike. Um, Air Force. Navy. Oh, na that's right. Navy. So yeah. pilot, you know, when I think pilot, man, I, I know, know most people do. That's my bad. That's my bad. I should know that by now. <laughs> Maybe. But, um, University of Maryland. Yes, sir. Did I get that part right? Yes, sir, you did. Thank you. <laughs> but I'll sort of pause there, man, and um, just have you kind of talk about your childhood, bring us up to date, and then I'm sure we'll have some wonderful questions for you. Okay. Um, I was a military brat, so my dad was in the Air Force. Uh, he was enlisted in the Air Force, so I grew up on military bases. I was born in San Antonio, and then, you know, Germany, Japan. And then uh, Maryland is kind of home where he was stationed at NSA and um, um, Andrews Air Force Base right right across um, from from DC. I used to go see uh, I used to go see air shows there and um, I never, never told anybody that I wanted to fly jets because um, I didn't know if it was possible, to be honest with you. And then I was uh, on um, on the base and there was an air show. And um, not that the Thunderbirds were performing. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw the first black aviator that I had ever seen. And I just, when I saw him, I just, I was walking with my, my hand in my mom's, uh, you know, holding my mom's hand. And I just took off running and I just mm -hmm. hugged him. I love it. And that's all I needed to do. I didn't want his autograph, anything. I just knew from that day on, it was possible. How old were you? Um, I want, uh, my mom says I was like eight. So, um, I could look at the years and figure out what it was, but it was around seven or eight years old. And, um, from, from then on, that's all I talked about is, um, becoming a, a pilot or a naval aviator or an aviator. So, um, went through, um, as DJ said, university of Maryland, and I took air force ROTC but um, I really wanted to be in the Navy. And I found out that first it was the Marine Corps and I went and took the test with the Navy Marine Corps and, and um, 
yeah, the rest is history. So went to flight school in Pensacola, Florida, and then ended up in Woodby Island, Washington, flying what we call EA6B um, prowlers. That's why my email is prowler guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm glad yeah. to have everybody yeah. else do that too. Yeah. <laughs> So, yep, that's a little bit of my background. Like I said, my dad was, he was Air Force, very disciplined, very, you know, hey, once he found out I wanted to be uh, um, an aviator, a pilot, he used that for everything. You know, you got to brush your teeth, you know, you got to wash your, you know, you got to get B's, you got to get A's. So everything he wanted me to do, he was like, if you want to do that, this is what you got to do now. So, you know, Chris, I find it really interesting that and I, I identify with that because I've had an experience like that as well uh, in, in some of my younger years where, you know, we can we can see ourselves in someone else, but we can also see it more clearly when that someone else looks like us. Yes. And I, I, I find that that's one of the unique things that I think in terms of being as black men that we have that type of experience. And I, again, I, like I said earlier, I have to have that. Are there other moments in your life, uh, perhaps in career as well, where something like that has shaped you and, and showed you that this is possible because of X, Y, Z? Huh. Um, that was the biggest. Um, that was one of the biggest hurdles. And because I was able to negotiate that program, which is pretty intense, um, I guess I got a little confident after that and that things were possible because that felt like that was definitely a unique club that they weren't just going to let you in. Um, but to DJ's point at um, at Nike, <clears throat> same type of thing. You didn't have too many on in, in jobs that you wanted. And so once you saw one or someone who had the skills or felt like they were operating at a higher level, you knew that, you know, it's interesting you said that, Charles, but it's sometimes it's not, is it possible? Is it, and I'm trying to think of how to say this, but are they going to let me? Right. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, what what is it going to take to to do this? Uh, is it going to be an open field? Is it going to be a level? Well, we know it's not going to be level, but is it, are they at least going to let me try to do it and see if I can do it? <clears throat> Yeah, I tell you what, Chris, um, you know, we started Nike at a time when the culture, culture felt like it was still blossoming, you know, in a lot of ways. And it's changed a whole lot. Yeah. It's not all good. It's not all bad. It's just what happens. Right. What would you say as far as you being a leader? When you started versus when you ended your journey, because you were at Nike for how many years? Twenty three. 23 years. I mean, that's incredible. And, and you've been in a number of different organizations. You've operated in many different capacities. How has your value system allowed you to lead in so many different environments and so many different pressurized situations? Hmm. <clears throat> that's a good question. I think a lot of it you know, it's interesting. I'm going to say it this way, but I think integrity starts inside. And I know you said value and I'll get there. And it's like, how are you when nobody's looking? Mm -hmm. What, you know, when I know I can get away with something, you know, and, and when you were young, you knew you could get away with it and you might have done it. And then later on, when you knew you could get away with something, but it wasn't, it didn't belong to you, whether it's a pen, a piece of paper, whatever it is that didn't belong to you. So, I started there and said, you know what, I've got to have so many values that my father has given to me, that I've gotten from my faith, that no matter what, I try to speak as if I'm being recorded and write as if I'm being you know, published. And so um, your question about values and change in different ways, I tried to be honored that um, first and felt like if I could look myself in the mirror and make decisions that way, then I would be able to do that on the outside. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that's where it starts. I'm gonna take you back to something, man, that um, I don't think a lot of our friends may even know about. Do you remember um, iron sharpening iron? I do. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what it meant to you? I <clears throat> 
I want to make sure I understand which which context you mean it in. So I'm gonna I want everything about it. Okay. Yeah, everything about it. So it's premise, but then there were some self discoveries in that as well, right? And not all of them great necessarily, but the premise of that. Um, I would start off by saying that. <laughs> Oh, this we got we getting right into it here, huh? <laughs> There's no warm up. Huh? Um, you know, and Charles, I'm gonna tell you this, and I'm sure you've heard this with different people, but Daryl Jones has had an enormous effect on me. And I'm gonna go back. Surprised. I would say the same for myself. I'm gonna go back to something he probably doesn't even remember. And um, and then I'll I'll I promise I'll try to get to your question, DJ, but uh, he was with the Jordan brand, had a sales in Jordan brand. He had on a, I mean, a nice little jump outfit with top and bottom jacket. And I was always looking for a hookup for some reason. First, I won one I got with Nike. It was about getting stuff 50% off. Then it was about getting it, right? <laughs> get the hookup. And when I saw him in it, I said, man, where did you get that? Can you hook a brother up? And he said, man, I got this at the employee store. He's like, I don't mess around with this stuff, man. I I can afford to buy things. I am going to buy it. And that hit me in so many ways because here this guy, he could go right down the hall and probably get a hookup, but he was not going to let that ever come back at him. And that was an opening that I had that somebody could say, yeah, I hooked you up with this. I hooked you up with this member back in the day. I hooked you from that day on, you wouldn't have been able to say that. So when you start talking about the premise of iron sharpening iron, not only did we do it and he do, did it a lot with me he, by talking to me, he did a lot of it by his actions. So that sharpened me in a way that I was a little dull. And I was able to take that into other parts of my career and life. So I don't even know if you remember that, DJ, but. No, I, I don't, Chris. And I, I really appreciate you sharing that. I don't. Um, but we've had so many experiences like that on both sides, man. Yeah. Um, but if we're being like, you know, if that's, if we're talking about relationship, right? And over time, like you guys have had this relationship for, sounds like at least close to 20 years, I would assume. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about how that should work in this context and environment, iron should be sharpening iron all, the, all time. the time. All the time. We should be looking at one another and going, wow, okay. Yeah, that hadn't even thought about that. And now it becomes a part of your repertoire of how yeah. you move and act in the world, right? Yes. And I think if if we're paying attention, and that's why I think, you know, we talk about about emotional intelligence and all, you know, how we leverage that to make ourselves better every single day. And if we're the right type of human beings, we're constantly doing that with one another because one, we care, and two, we just wanna be better, right? Yes. And if we're paying attention to your point, the, the cool thing about that, Chris, is you were paying attention. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I don't know that we're always, as people in general, we're not always paying attention, you know? And when we are paying attention, there's these little nuggets that you pick up that change everything about how you move in the world and makes it better. And that's deep, Chris. I, I tell you, man, um, and that's a great point, Charles. You know, uh, so when I asked, I even meant the formal sense where you opened up your home every Saturday morning to eight to 10 brothers who decided yeah. we all want to be, be better and we can learn from each other. Yes. And it was a non-denominational yeah. sort of celebration of being there, but also we need to be sharing with each other. We yeah. need to be sharing information. Hey, had you heard? So we did that on Saturday mornings early. Yes. At your home. Yes. We called it iron sharpening. Iron. Yes. Now yes. Fell off and showed up, you know, 30 minutes right. late and all this kind of stuff. Right. But what I do know is your door was always open five minutes to nine and I was always there. Yes. Right. Yes. And some of us extend it beyond that. But when I think about that iron sharpening iron, man, I go, I can literally see us sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. I remember so very well. In the world, man, tell me, hey, did you hear so and so? Man, I, I, you might not like this, but this is what I heard is happening around right. you. Just know. 
right. All that. That's beautiful. No, yeah. yeah. And I used to get some negative feedback from them. I mean, DJ specifically, he would say, hey, this is what I'm hearing. And this is what they're saying about you. And it hurt. Right. And some things are, are true and some things are a lot of things aren't true, but that's what you are putting out there. And he's like, hey, I don't know. I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't be doing that, but just know that this is the read. And uh, those those times were invaluable. So so, Chris. Um, you coming this way, man. I am. He, I am. Call a, I'll call it a house. Oh. <laughs> I think it's a little bit more than that, but <laughs> you want to tell us about your uh, potential? <clears throat> I've been, my wife and I have been going back and forth with um, in that in that Scottsdale area, and we've just we've loved it for so long. Um, the summers, I'm gonna have to get DJ to help me get over that. He, <laughs> but uh, you just go somewhere else. That's how you. That's, that, that's what we uh, talking about. But yeah, we're we're coming out to Fountain Hills, so I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, but uh, nice. yeah, so uh, the house should be ready in March, and uh, we'll Thank be coming you. out that way. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Now, you I'm mentioned, to connect this and you mentioned your beautiful wife. Can you tell us about her? Yeah, Paulette is, um, she's just, uh, where do I begin? I won't, uh, I won't um, belay it too long. But um, yeah, we met through a, a Bible study at Nike. Her daughter came to a Bible study and we met about 10 years ago and uh, we got married like seven years ago. So it's a blended family. And between us, we have five kids and nine grandkids. Oh, awesome. Wow. Yeah. wow. So that's part of the reason we're going to Scottsdale and leaving them here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I can get my wife back to myself. <laughs> Chris, what part of Maryland did you grow up? I grew up first on the base on um, Fort Meade and then right outside of there in, in Odington. So I went to Arundel High School out in Anne Arundel County. Do you, are you familiar with the area? I was just out in Anne Arundel County this past weekend. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Got, uh, relatives and uh, my cousin, who she's living in Hanover right now. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That's right up the street. Yep. yep. That, that's where I went to high school. And then, uh, like DJ said, then went on to University of Maryland. And then um, she made the trek out west from there. Go Terps. I'm a North Carolina boy, so uh, I went to undergrad at North Carolina A&T and then UNC Chapel Hill. So I saw a few UNC Carol uh, UNC uh, Maryland battles uh, throughout the years, for sure. <clears throat> we didn't win many of them. <laughs> <laughs> that was so, Chris, obviously you had a... Uh, storied and decorated journey uh, at Nike and um, invited to participate in elevated leadership experiences that I, not everyone was because of your work performance. Um, I think if you ask anybody about Chris Monroe, it's always um, leading, but leading for his people, um, leading for his business, leading for his accounts. And that was always your first thought. When you left Nike and decided, you know what, it's time. I'm sure it wasn't an easy decision in every aspect, but how has life been for you since you left? Um, it has been really, really good. <laughs> um, it was like you just said, 23 years, met some of the best people, um, had some of the best experiences. And I, I don't, I mean, you know, we could say good, bad, all that, but I just think it was just a great, um, just overall. Um, then I took a, a couple of years off and just, cause I, I didn't think I was going to do anything else. I just wanted to relax, move to Scottsdale, start taking up golf. And I haven't taken up yet. Um, I'll be as good as DJ in about a month after I get there. I'll be able to catch up with you guys. <laughs> it, it might take me a little bit longer because of the move. So six weeks, I'll be able to play with you guys. <laughs> well, and, then, <laughs> and to DJ's point, um, I started working with some of the accounts that uh, I was managing. And um, and then one of them asked me if I wanted to to kind of come on as um, as a part owner. So for the last 18 months or so, I've been doing that. So it's interesting because I'm back on now. I'm on the 
other side, um, working with Nike and Jordan. Um, and now I, I used to put myself in their, their, their shoes and under, kind of understand what was going on. But now I truly understand what's going on on this side and how powerful the brand is and how important it is to the consumer sector we serve. So it's been, uh, to answer your question, DJ, it's been fun. You take those experiences and those people that uh, you you had a good network with, and you you know figure out who you really want to stay in contact with, and um, and you just move on. The, the The grass is green, and and the water is just as blue. So it's been good. You know, cu- curious question for me because obviously the the two of you experienced a great deal of success uh, in that environment, and I would I would I would characterize it as, you know, big corporate business, uh, you know, even though we're talking about a different category in terms of, you know, sports and apparel and, you know, all the other things that Nike in, is connected to. But um, how did the two of you manage to, obviously, some of the things where uh, you, you just share the connection amongst, you know, other brothers in, in the environment, but how did the two of you manage to, I don't want to use the word survive, but excel in that, in, that, that environment over such longevity. I mean, I I was at GE Capital for, call it, I'm trying to think how long I was there, probably close to three years or so. And I made the transit. I went to law school and, you know, took a di- completely different path. But I also saw before I left there, and it wasn't because, what well, I left there to go to law school, not necessarily for another opportunity, obviously, but it's always curious. I was always curious about how do people manage to survive yeah. over the long term, and not only survive but thrive and flourish, despite the headwinds that I know that we all come up against in in big corporate America. Um, it goes back to um, the subject matter of I think people can see your value and see your integrity, and. Um, that to me is important, and and knowing that who you are within yourself. And then it's relationships and it's, it's being a student. Um, I, I learned a lot and I was never to thought that I had anything so down that I could not learn and pick up things. And, and from people like DJ and people that were uh, ahead of me and, and then organizations, but even people that I was managing the team, I was learning from them every day. And I would tell them, Hey, you know, I'm a sponge and I want to pick up. And if you see something that I'm doing wrong or something that I can be better at, then please let me know. So I would say it's just that always growing, always learning and um, being a student. Uh, um, and DJ, I'll let you jump in and and say your POV on that one. So I'll give uh, two responses. One would be as an outsider observing you, Chris, what I would say is, you were an egoless leader, but a confident leader. So if you didn't know, you say, I don't know, but I'll find out. And if you knew, you would tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's really at the end of the day, all you can ask for. Mm -hmm. You weren't up there making stuff up, but you were also very authentic. Anytime I was a part of, uh, Chris Monroe meeting or a conversation or whatever it was, people left with clarity. He's going to get back to us on this or because you you managed a national business yeah. that was really critical to Nike's success, especially in North America. Yeah. We called it City Specialty and it was our quote unquote urban accounts, mm-hmm. whatever that means to people. But it was those that kind of had the heartbeat of the city on their shoulders. And where we would probably go where we grew up looking for product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, before Dick's and you know, all that right. kind of stuff right, right. was right. So there was an authenticity that had to come with that, and you you always represented that. Right. Thank you. Um, so that's the other part of it. I also think um what what's tough at Nike is to do what you said to be clear that I'm learning, but I'm also your leader. That That's not easy, it's especially being black, yeah. right? It's because you're always, always gaining credibility. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the few places where you can have a vice president title, senior director, whatever it is, 
but there's still people on your team who expect you to earn what you got. Now, whether you become a part of that transaction or not is up to you, but they could be sponsored by somebody who, right? So there's right. always that. To me, it's understanding what you know best and what you don't know and closing that gap. That's that is my journey that the, the well, entire so time. Closing that gap right? quickly. Right? Quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And, and not letting anything get in the way of you closing that gap and not thinking too much about the next job, but operating as if you were always ready to do that job. Yeah. But but not talking about it, not not thinking about it and not. Um, and I would assume, that the, you know, for me, I'm just thinking through that, like the baseline is just the competence, right? You had to have the competence. Absolutely. That's first and foremost. But beyond that, I also know that, you know, in, in any corporate environment, there's I don't want to call them shenanigans, but there's certainly a, a, a you've you've got to play a certain game in some respects. But I think it sounds like from that takeaway, which I love, by the way, is that forget about playing a game. Just do you and do it really, really well and keep moving. And if for some reason, reason the system spits you out, then you needed to be spit out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's not the place for you. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but but you were one of few. Who put in 23 years, man. Of leadership, that's impressive. Come on, twenty three years. We know how that system can work. Yeah, you can be done after two years. Yeah, yeah. Not that you're not talented, but we've seen it. Like, man, this ain't working. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, you know, kudos on that one, man. Um, Thank you. So, growing up, was sport critical? To your existence, was it critical to who Chris Monroe was? And if so, tell us a little bit about that, Chris. One, absolutely. Um, I think uh, sports just teach us so much. I mean, uh, we could we could talk for an hour. We wouldn't even scratch the surface of the things that we learn in sports. And the obvious ones are teamwork, right? And working together as a goal, seeing that something is bigger than yourselves, um, being able to show up on time at practice, giving your all. And sometimes you're not giving it all, you're all for your coach. You're giving it for the person, uh, the man next to you or the boy or whatever it is. So yeah, I played um, baseball, football, and basketball as a kid. And um, I just love that camaraderie. I love that teamwork of working together, picking each other up, and um, just having that goal. And, and of course, we played at a time when not everybody got the trophy, right? You, <laughs> you had to make the team, right? <laughs> you, you didn't just pay and you were on the team. And then when you made the team, you had to fight for playing time. So it just taught you so much. And, and yeah, you might be going out of the same position with this person and you want to play and start if it's quarterback or a guard or whatever it is. But it's playing within the rules, not trying to undercut that person, always cheering that person on. But then when you get out there, you are doing your best and you're not just doing your best. I didn't play individual sports and I'm not down talking to anybody that did, but it was about the team first. And that's what I love. That's that's super spot on. And I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of what I think is missing sometimes, particularly with young people, and you talk about the trophies, everybody gets one, right? Or everybody makes the team. Mm-hmm. It's the adversity piece, I think, that we learned early on. And I think sports is a really, really good outlet to provide that, that, that adversity early on of like not making a team. Yeah, exactly. Get it. To make a team. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You know, or, or not playing. Yes. <laughs> you know, playing hurt. <laughs> well, you know, exactly, playing hurt. I mean, I, I remember, I mean, I I didn't make the basketball team until I was in the ninth grade. I mean, I sixth, seventh, eighth, didn't make the team. You know, and, and it just, you know, you, every year you just, you know, okay, I'm going back at it. I'm going back at it. And that not only the adversity of like, if you want to call it failing, right, um, but also um, – Going back and deciding you're going to work harder to have a better shot the next time. And I just think, you know, these the, the kids today, you know, I, I um, still don't know the circumstances, but, uh, you know, my daughter's off at a, at a boarding school and had a young man at her school yesterday commit suicide. And I don't know any of the circumstances behind that, mm-hmm. but I know they're all going through college applications and admissions and 
You know, yeah. you get to the point, man, when these disappointments hit you and you're dealing with adversity and something doesn't go your way. And then the most catastrophic thing that could ever happen to a family happens, you know? Yeah. A child takes their life. I mean, it's just so tragic. And I, I think that, um, I don't know how we translate some of the things that we experience as young people that have helped us today, but I, I, t truly sports was a big fund for me in terms of, you know, all those, like you said, the obvious lessons that are there, but also some of the other ones that made you have this grit um, and this determination and this willingness to sort of get up off the mat and go at it again and do your best and try to figure out how to, how to make it, you know, how to make it next year or, or how to get playing time or, or to your point about doing this for, you know, your team, you want to win, you know, that type of thing. It's just, well, Charles, you you said something that just woo, I forgotten about it. Tenth grade, I walked up to that outdoor of the gym and looked at that list of the fifteen, and my name was not on it. Yeah, and that sick feeling of I did not make the team. Yeah, and and it was just a metaphor because the door to the gym was closed and you're on the outside. And guess what? For the next few months, you if you're going in there, you're going to watch. <laughs> the people that you tried, right? Yeah. And so going this feeling is not going to happen again. Yeah. And, and it's a metaphor for I didn't get the job, right? Or I didn't get the promotion. Or, you know, I didn't get the girl. You know, yeah. however you want to, you know, yep. whatever context you want to put that in. And I do think that those are good lessons because we know how to wake up the next day and life goes on and we move on and we try to do do it, just do it and be better. And when, I just, when I was a, a flight instructor, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Charles, go ahead. Good, you're good. Uh, when I was a flight instructor in the Navy and would take up, um, you know, young pilots or new pilots training, um, you could always tell the ones that had been in adverse situations their whole life and was able to overcome because you have to be able to shake things off. Cause I'll say, Hey, you didn't do that. Boom, boom. Did you, are you sitting in there and resting in that? Or are you going to keep moving? Because the jet is moving seven miles a minute. So we can't be back here, right? We got to be up in front of that airplane. And so be able to give you feedback, you take it and then apply it as um, I could always tell the one man, most aviators played sports. And then sometimes the ones that played again, not bad to individual sports versus team sports. Right. And it's just knowing that it's all about the team and it's outside of yourself and you're not just depending on yourself. You know, there's a, there's a group of us or there's other people in the plane. Uh, so that, yeah, that's a good one. So sports has been an integral part DJ to answer your question to, to me, to life. Yeah. And having that sense of like losing, like, and you don't losing as a team, you don't want to feel have that feeling. You want to win, and yeah. you carry that in. You carry that into your team, uh, in, in an organization, into your company. Like we want to win. Yeah, um, and in a good way, right? Because it's yeah. not win at all costs. Yeah, it is win. And if you don't win, you're a good sportsman. You hey, good game. You you're dapping somebody up, and you just you, you're you're getting your teammates. Hey, that's all right. We'll get them next week. That's and just get better. yeah, so it's taking it on and having all those emotions, but being able to manage them in a way that you are still showing up. Hundred percent. So Chris, is our time? We got about ten minutes. Um, you know you. Um, it was interesting being at Nike, you know, 19 and a half for me, over 23 for you. Um, a lot of peaks and valleys, but primarily I would say we experienced a lot of success at, as a brand, right? Um, and product gets a lot of credit for that. Mm -hmm. What doesn't is the people. Yeah, yeah. And I, I always say that because I know a lot of companies were great product. I don't have a problem with a lot of Audi product. I don't have a problem with a lot of Puma product. They make some cool stuff these days. And Nike's had its peaks and valleys as far as product. But the people are very intelligent, very team oriented. Moreover, yep. very focused and grade their papers tougher than anybody else is ever going to grade. Yeah. Their paper, right. Yes. As you sit here today, if you were to look back to 1997, 
and see Chris Monroe walk in that building, what would you tell him? Mm. Wow. Um, not to lose yourself, um, to, 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 to continue to walk with that, um, that integrity, that honor that you've, you've always had, that you, um, was in the military and was very important, um, that your brand on the outside is not as important as how you feel on the inside and doing things that you can feel good about. Um, because we start, or at least I do, I was like, you start trying to manage your brand a little bit and you get outside of yourself. Now, how far outside of yourself do you get um, is kind of up to you or, or the people that you surround yourself with. And um, so just to to keep that self-worth inside versus letting other people manage that for you. Because there were times that other people, I let, I let other people make me feel like I shouldn't be in the room or shouldn't be in that job or I didn't do something well. And, and I put more into that than I probably should have. Um, so that's a, that was a knock on me and my personality. So that's probably what I would tell myself. Well, in my opinion, you, you, if you, if that happened, you recognize it and manage it well. Thank you. Um, and I want to say this because what Charles and I like to do is if you have any questions of us or if there's anything we missed, we want to give you the opportunity to share it. Um, I want to say something first, though. My experience in almost 20 years, a lot of associates, a fair number of friends, only a few I could trust. You're one of them. Thank you. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. I remember giving you a call one night and I, and I, you were the first person that came to mind. So I want to say thank you. Right. It's my pleasure. Yep. Um, I praise. Did we miss anything or is there anything you want to ask us? Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about Charles's background, but we can, we can do that over, um, yes. Yeah. So you said you went to law school and just, so I, I just love to hear more about that, but we could do that offline. Um, um, so are you coming here next. The end of this month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah we'll have to, I'm around. I mean, between yeah. the two of your homes, I'm not sure which one I'm going to get more excited about. Going to visit. <laughs> hey, Charles, you're gonna be, dis guy, you gonna be disappointed in mine. Did I say homes? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you agree. Charles, anything you want to? Chris did ask a little. I bit. do want to thank you guys, not just for this time and this opportunity, but for what you guys are doing and what you guys stand for in this space. So um, I'm sure you get accolades, but probably not as many as you deserve in this space. And so thank you. Thank you for all the you know, Thank you, because I tell you, you know, the, the conversation that DJ and I, I are having in this podcast is really about the people who, you know, we have the opportunity to learn more about. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing for me when I get to meet people that have been a part of DJ's world in his life and learn more about them. Um, and and see the richness that they bring uh, to you know not only the conversation but what they've done in life to to help inspire others and so it's always great to be a part of that dialogue and and I, you know I'll probably venture to say it's vice versa and then there there are often many times when we get to meet people that neither one of us have a connection to and we learn so much um, so it's it's uh, it goes both ways you know we we can't be successful in this venue without having great people like yourself who can share. You know, with you know this audience that we have, you know all the great things that you've done in your life and your world, and that we're uh, we're getting to hear more about. And then something that will resonate with you, I must say this once a week is um, the fruit of the poisonous tree. Yes. <laughs> and so you know, of course, it applies to the law, but it applies to life, right? 
Absolutely, always. It, it applies to life. And um, so you can't do one thing wrong and then think behind it. So there's going to be some blessings. It's like, yeah. no, no, that whole tree is poison now. So um, my wife and I were just talking about that yesterday. So I just, I thought about you when you said uh, the law that you would remember that because I was pre-law in college. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I practiced law for five years and, um, you know, it, it was probably the greatest five-year education I've ever had. Um, and I'm, I'm, I became an entrepreneur, uh, been a business owner for the last 20 years now. Um, and I don't think had I gone down the path of practicing law, you know, going to law school, practicing law, that I would have ever moved into this entrepreneurial path. I don't think it would have ever happen. Um, and uh, so I'm really grateful for that experience. But I learned a lot in terms of uh, just how to navigate that environment. And, and, you know, it's interesting, my, you know, my moment where you know, I saw something as being possible uh, was when I was practicing law. And uh, I was actually, I had been working on a, I was doing mergers and acquisitions work as a young attorney and, and had worked on this deal tirelessly for probably, gosh, I mean, a good, you know, two months. And at the closing, um, the partner that I've been working with invited me to the closing um, to basically, you know, they basically, you know, back, in, back, back in those days, you literally had a, in-person closing where you sat down and you went through like a stack of like a hundred documents and they signed their name and literally a check was passed across the room. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I went to this closing and lo you know, this trash company that's being, I still remember this trash company being sold, but, but to about to this big company here in Arizona for like 40 million bucks. And I walk into the closing room and lo and behold, it's a brother uh, who's selling his company. And, you know, it's walking out of the room. I mean, this is, this is 20 plus years ago. So $40 million is a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot now. So it definitely is a lot, it was a lot now. So I can imagine <laughs> how much it was then. Yeah. They were paying him, you know, something like a half million dollar year consulting fee just to kind of like stay out of the business, right? And not compete, if you will. And it blew me away. Yeah. It blew me away. And right then and there, I said to myself, I'm on the wrong side of the room. Mm. That's the path where I'm headed. That's where I want to mm -hmm. be. Um, and I, I remember it like it was yesterday. And it was it was that moment. You know, I didn't I didn't run up to him and go give him a hug. But I went. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, I knew from at that moment I, I started planning my exit. I, I, I was planning my exit for when I was going to leave the law firm and what would be my ne next move. Oh, wow. Wow. DJ, do you have one like that? You know, um, in high school, I wanted to be a psychologist. I wanted to, you know, get my doctorate in psychology. Um, I love my psychology classes. Um, my professor at the time was one of the nicest guys in the world. My high school teacher and um, I knew in high school I'm like you know I want to be a doctor one day and I had a conversation with him but then I got to college and Dr. Ernie Betts was one of our advisors a brother and he pulled me aside one day and we had a conversation about thinking five and ten years out and no matter what I did Chris I knew one day I wanted to get my doctor. Mm -hmm. I made that commitment to myself. And I said, I'm not going to leave this earth. I don't care what happens. And um, it was that conversation that fueled me to make that commitment to myself. Awesome. There was really no reason for me to do it from a financial standpoint. I actually <laughs> put it down. <laughs> <a moment. laughs> but um, intellectually, man, you know, I... Um, it was a hell of a journey, but that conversation started in high school, being introduced to someone who had done it and um, who looked like me. And I said, you know what? I like that look. Yeah. And I like the fact that he's focused on helping other folks. Yeah. So I say that moment. Um, but yeah, that's the one I could probably point to. Isn't that something that you, we know we're, we're, we're connecting with 
each other and we're helping each other and we're sharpening. But even, I don't know if that guy, even Charles, is, does he know to this day that you're on this side because of him? And we it's just, yeah. yeah, so you're sharpening. People are looking all the time. And all the time. again, thank you guys for what you're doing because even if they don't acknowledge it, you are sharpening people, right? Just you guys are making people sharp of all backgrounds. So thank you. Yeah, well, we appreciate yeah, we appreciate it, appreciate it and look forward to seeing you here. That's uh, it's exciting. We will. Paul, Paul let I say hello. And I will. I don't make it up that way before you guys. Uh, you won't. <laughs> we'll make it to you before you make it. Whether you, you guys are experiencing more. <laughs> yeah, no reason. I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> You're but, welcome, As always, much love, brother. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you guys. It was a pleasure, Chris. Okay. Look forward to meeting with you in person, Charles. Likewise, likewise. Okay. Thank you for joining us on The Conscious Vibe. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Peace, Chris. Bye. Thank you for joining us. And check us out on tcvpodcast.com. <laughs>